maybe a question at the end, we don't understand why so many people have this. What it demonstrated was the enormous amount of money that's been spent over the last six or seven years, and then the statistics which indicate that the problem is still as great as it ever was, that essentially we haven't gotten very much for our money. Yeah, because modern life certainly puts even more pressure sure. on people. Sure. But don't you think that maybe in the past five, ten years, there's been a, a group of doctors that actually do think more about what you're, that have started to come around to believe that there is some no, interest? No, you see, you, it's you're, a small hearing, group you're a very, very small group, and what you're hearing is more talk about mind-body medicine. But if you look up what this amounts to, if you, um, if you look on the web and go and find out what these doctors are saying, it's really a rather general kind of thing, a kind of general recognition that stress may be important in our lives. But I have seen nothing that essentially recognizes what I've been talking about, uh, and that is we're talking about a relationship between the mind and the body in which there are definite events occurring as a result of what's going on emotionally. And this is really the realm of psychosomatic medicine. And the word is not a good word because people don't understand what it means. They think it means kooky or weird or right. strange and so yeah, you're on. you're crazy. So you're crazy, and so I tend to avoid it. But if you think about it, technically, that's correct. This is psycho, meaning, and of course, the, 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 that, <laughs> that um, psycho is so terrible. I mean, it implies. In fact, I don't even refer to psychotherapy. I call it psych therapy. Okay? Um, right, because the word psycho has such yeah, a... Yeah, it has so many, so many terrible right. connotations and so on. But this connection between the mind and the body, of course, has always been so. And the fact that it is uh, totally ignored now is very upsetting. It's a public health problem of major magnitude. I have concluded after all these years that the only thing I can do to possibly make a small dent in the problem is to try to continue educating doctors, primary care physicians. And what I would teach them is what this disorder is all about, how essentially benign it is once you have ruled out cancer or something of that sort, and that they should treat the patients themselves and not send them to the specialists. Because once you send them to the specialists, they're gone. That's true. That's true, because yeah. they're on to the next fix. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, so that's I, what you're spending... I mean, you, do, you still see patients... Oh, I see, oh, sure. I see patients, you know, three days a week, and then I have my two-hour lecture every Monday evening, and then tomorrow night we're having this. Uh, that panel is a once-a-month affair. The other Tuesdays I have group meetings that I conduct. I have nine or ten people who are still struggling to get through. They've attended the lectures. They're doing their homework. Doing homework, of course, is very, very important in this. And I keep... Uh, I um, make sure that patients understand this. We find that writing can be extremely helpful. And the latest thing that I've introduced, and it is really brand new, is talking to people about getting in touch with their inner self. Sounds almost Buddhist. But the fact of the matter is, I think the Buddhists are very wise. And Tibetan Buddhists I'm thinking of in particular. And how do you advise people to get in touch with their inner selves? It's kind of like meditation. A quiet time, close their eyes, and imagine six-year-old Donna standing in front of you and saying to six-year-old Donna, you know, right now... Uh, you had to be a good little girl and so on, and that, and that made you angry, and maybe sometimes uh, you were unhappy and sad and so on. You just sort of 
conversing with her and letting her know that you, the adult, mature, intellectual you, is her friend. Good stuff. And Very I've just, just started to introduce that as another therapeutic strategy. You see how far away this is from conventional medicine. This is a whole other world. It is a whole other world. And what we need to do is get more doctors recognizing that this world exists and to start trying to introduce it into their practices. When you teach doctors, do you find that they are receptive to this? Well, I only teach the doctors who want to be taught. Oh, sure. But there aren't very many. I had an enthusiastic patient in the area who said, what can I do to, you know, to help out, to further this business? And I said, find me doctors. So indeed, he found a doctor in his community and he sent him and he spent some time with me here. And now he'll go back and try to put these principles to work. But it's a, you know... A slow go. Drop in the bucket. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I take it you've really seen some, some miraculous things happen in here, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's very gratifying. Um, well, if um, Stephanie were to tell you her situation, she was extremely disabled. And she'll probably tell you when yes, we question her about sure. it. Yeah. And so she went from being a almost totally disabled individual to a highly functional one now. So for people out there, for people who are in Maryland or hear this story and they won't be able to see you, what would you no, advise them? No, and of course them? across the country, all they can do is to read the books. And there are four of them. They're all on the Amazon list, which is probably the simplest way. They're certainly not going to find it in the local bookstore in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, but if they go to the web and, and, and hook into Amazon, um, and that's the best thing, and to hope that um, there's a certain number of them that will get better just from reading the books. And then the others may say, well, you know, I'm, let me see if I can interest my doctor in this. And, or find a psychologist and might be willing to work with me. But just knowing about it can help some people, oh, you my, think? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, it puts a whole different face on your pain, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Y you know in what I mean? Fact, it just puts a whole different... In fact, if you think about it, uh, as your pain is protecting you from something, mm -hmm. but how about this, which I've been saying lately to patients. Think about your pain as your friend. It's telling you something. It's saying, pay attention. How about that? So it's, it's, a du it's serving a double purpose. Protection on the one hand and knowledge information on the other hand about a very important part of you what's going on inside. So there's nothing that you advise people to do physically, like uh, take yoga classes or... Um, I tell them that those things are okay, <laughs> but they're not going to cure you. Right. In fact, what I say to patients uh, as soon as they come into the program during that initial lecture, you have to get out of the physical ballpark entirely and get into the psychological ballpark. And that's a very, very important thing. And very hard for some people to do. Of I course, think. of course. And of course, it's interesting. A very bright young woman many years ago made a statement at one of our meetings, denial of the syndrome is part of the syndrome. What does that mean? That your brain doesn't want you to think that this, this is psychological. It wants you to stay focused on your body. I just talked to one of my patients today who's been working with one of our psychologists, and he said... It's great. I'm 95% better. I've got back to do everything. My life is great now, but I still have a little bit of pain and a little bit of doubt that it's not entirely TMS. What do I do? I said, go back to your psychologist. You're not quite finished. <laughs> and he'll do it. He'll be at the meeting tomorrow night, but he'll do that. 
And that's true. The modicum of doubt means that the brain still needs to continue either your pain or your fear. Fear is a big, big factor in this whole business. Fear of? Fear of the pain. And it's, it's again, these are fears that we carry over from childhood very often. Well, because, I mean, I guess everybody has their kid yeah. still inside. Oh, oh, yeah, we all do. Oh, yes. I, I still uh, am having to communicate with mine <laughs> at my age. <laughs> it's never, you know, one of my psychologists is somebody, he says, my patient asks me, how long is this going to take? And he says to them, only a lifetime. Well, you know what Dr. Phil says, life is not cured, it's only managed. Yeah. <laughs> Another great saying that I love, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. I like that. Isn't that good? That's a very nice one. Yeah. Because nobody had a perfect childhood. No. Even with the best meaning parents. Exactly. You had hurts and things that weren't attended to. and exactly. Yeah. You know, there's always that need there, I think. That is wonderful. Thank you. Did, do you think that we've covered things? I think we have. Okay, good. And I thank you for the I opportunity. Thank you.